Generation 9 changed the way Pokemon games are played forever. And in this video, I'm going to talk about what that means for Nuzlocking, Pokemon's self-imposed challenge mode. If you're new to this channel, I'm FlygonHG, and I have a bit of experience with Nuzlocks. Although there are dozens of different variations with their own complicated rule sets, at its most basic, a Nuzlocke playthrough of any Pokemon game only requires two simple rules. One, if a Pokemon faints in battle, it's dead. You can't use it anymore. A once bright and beautiful life has been snuffed out because of your gross negligence and no amount of universal free healthcare can bring it back. And two, you can only catch the first Pokemon on each route or location in the game. Follow these two rules until you've become champion of the Pokemon League in your game of choice, and congratulations, you've completed a Nuzlocke. For most Pokemon games, that's pretty straightforward. But in Scarlet and Violet, following these rules is not as simple as it sounds, and it's left a lot of people confused on how to even get started. So in this video, we'll be discussing the best way to go about setting up a Scarlet and Violet Nuzlocke, starting first with the standard rules, and then a brief discussion on a set of additional rules that I like to use in my challenge videos, informally known as the Hardcore Nuzlocke rule set. And finally, we'll wrap up the video by just briefly discussing a few tips and tricks for Nuzlocking in Scarlet and Violet. Let's begin. Starting aptly with the first rule of Nuzlocking, fainting equals death. This is the less complicated of the two rules and remains largely the same in Scarlet and Violet as it did in previous generations. The premier games of Gen 9 are pretty tough though, so expect death to be all around you, especially if you're going through this game for the first time. The good news is that there are a few changes in Gen 9 that make the first Nuzlocke rule a little less scary. For one, with the auto battle function, you can gain experience, and the guts of your fallen victims, free from the worry of losing any Pokémon at all. A Pokémon that's sent out to auto battle will never faint. They'll always come running back with just a little bit of HP left. Now auto battling does give you less experience than regular battles, but I think that trade-off is a price worth paying to know that you'll never have to suffer an unexpected loss while grinding levels against wild Pokémon. Similarly to auto battling, Pokémon also won't faint during the button mashing minigame that takes place every time you raid a team starbase. During one of these bouts, you'll mindlessly send out three Pokémon at a time to stomp through hordes of oncoming enemy Pokémon. With the right type matchups, it's pretty much completely trivial, if not a bit tedious, but if a Pokémon does happen to get worn out here, I personally wouldn't count that as a death. Don't think that these team star bases are totally free though, because after the minigame warm-up you'll be facing off against the leader of the base in a much more traditional battle, and many of these fights can be really challenging if you're not prepared, so be sure to plan accordingly. The last small point to address here is that in Generation 9, a new move called Revival Blessing was introduced, which can be used to revive a fallen ally. Personally, I would never allow this move to be used in a Nuzlocke, the same way that I don't allow myself to use revives. Pokémon are dead as soon as they faint, not at the end of the battle. Now, if you do want to use a Revival Blessing clause or something like that to give yourself a little more leeway, then as with any other changes to the rules, by all means feel free to do so. That gets us to Nuzlocke rule number two. You can only catch the first Pokémon that you find on each route or area of the game. Different routes are generally defined by areas that result in a unique met location when a Pokémon is caught there. This rule serves two purposes. First, by preventing you from choosing a specific encounter, it encourages you to try out Pokémon that you might otherwise overlook. Ask anyone who's done even a single Nuzlocke, and most of them will have a story about how they gained a newfound appreciation for some random Pokémon they've never used before. For me, in my first Nuzlocke, that was a Fero. The second purpose is that it reduces the overall amount of Pokémon that you can catch in any playthrough, increasing the difficulty of the entire game, especially once you start losing some of your better teammates. In previous generations, this rule was pretty easy to execute. You walk into a new route, step into the grass, and in mere seconds you're randomly ambushed by your soon-to-be best friend forever. 99% of the time, it was as easy as that. But in Paldea, encounters aren't random. Everything happens in the overworld, meaning that you can effectively choose your first encounter by just avoiding every other Pokémon until you find the one you want, which does seem to defeat one of the primary purposes for using rule number two in the first place. The wild area in Sword and Shield had a similar issue, though that could be somewhat mitigated by just ignoring overworld encounters and solely using the random encounters that still existed in that game. But since Paldea doesn't have any random encounters at all, we need another solution. And an easy one is that once you get into a new area, you just use the honor system and catch the first Pokémon that you happen to see. Or, if you don't trust yourself, and why should you, you can blindfold yourself and do it that way. 
But these solutions still have a massive problem, and that has to do with the fact that the different areas of Paldea are massive, with Pokémon being drastically different at various locations within a single area itself. This means that upon repeat playthroughs, the first Pokémon you see at the beginning of any given area will almost always be the exact same Pokémon, and some Pokémon will be completely impossible to get. One of the best features of Nuzlocking is that it adds diversity to repeat playthroughs, which is effectively lost with this simple solution. So obviously, we need a better one. And here, I'm proposing three. The first is what I call the blindfolded pin drop method. In this method, every time you come across a new area, you immediately open up the map and set a pin somewhere within the confines of that area. Then, you head straight to your pin, ignoring all Pokémon along the way. Once you've arrived, Blindfold yourself, give the camera a few spins, and start feeling your way towards the nearest Pokémon. If you've done it right, congratulations! You've got yourself a moderately random new teammate. Now, this method can be somewhat manipulated by knowing where the best encounters in the area are, but Nuzlocks, especially at a higher level, have always been manipulated, either with repels or by simply controlling whether you look for your first Pokémon in the tall grass, the water, a honey tree, or whatever. Using game knowledge for slight, and sometimes not so slight, manipulation has always been a staple of Nuzlocking, and I think this method stays true to that spirit. But if that doesn't sound great to you, you can always use method 2, the random number generator method. For this method, you'll need to know all the various potential encounters in any given region. And then using this a priori knowledge, you can assign each potential encounter a number and use a random number generator to decide which one you get. Or you know, you can spin a wheel, pull marbles out of a bag, whatever you want to do. The downside of this approach is that it gives every potential encounter an equal chance of being selected, regardless of whether the encounter is actually rare or common. This could be fixed by using a weighted random number generator and assigning ranges of numbers to different Pokémon based on their spawn rates, but at the time of recording this video, I don't think spawn rates are something that are readily accessible on any of the major databases online. So until then, if you want to use method 2, it's going to have to be totally random. The third and final method is the Terra Raid Den method, which might be the cleanest of the three methods. Once you've arrived in a new area, simply find the nearest Terra Raid Den and that becomes your new team member. The nice thing about this method is that as long as you win the raid, you're guaranteed to catch the Pokémon. It also means that you'll have access to a very wide range of Pokémon early on, though that could be a downside because it means that you'll have very little control of what Pokémon you get. This method is almost like randomizing your encounters. Based on how you want to play, that might be a good or a bad thing. These three methods can also be mixed and matched. Particularly, the blindfolded pin drop and the Terra Raid Den methods could be preferred for different areas in the same playthrough. Or maybe you want to use the blindfolded pin drop, take a look around, and then use a random number generator to determine which encounter on the screen you go for first. Let me know which method or combination of methods you prefer in the comments down below. But with the basic Nuzlocke rules squared away, that brings us to one very important question. Where does the Nuzlocke actually end? And what parts of the game do you even include? Okay, that's actually two important questions. In literally every other game in the franchise, Nuzlocke's end after you've completed all eight badges, challenged the Elite Four, become champion, and seen the credits roll. But in Scarlet and Violet, things are a little bit more complicated. Don't worry, I'll be keeping story details as spoiler-free as possible in this section. Now, there are eight gym badges, and an Elite Four, and a champion, but there's also two other storylines that you can complete, or you can just completely ignore them. In order to get to the credits of the game, though, you'll need to complete all three storylines and do a final chunk of story that sees them all come together. It's... a lot of story. And for the very first playthrough of the game, it is incredibly rewarding to do the entire thing and see the story unfold. As someone who normally doesn't care at all about the story in Pokémon, this one is actually pretty spectacular, and I'd highly recommend playing it through at least once. But for repeat playthroughs, it's a lot of dialogue, folks. Like, easily an hour plus of dialogue after you've beaten the champion, for essentially one or two fights that are really cool, but probably not that worth it. Plus, you'll get DMCA'd by Ed if you stream the credits anyways. The most simplistic way to Nuzlocke is to focus solely on the Victory Road storyline, which more or less ends with challenging the Elite Four and becoming champion. Pokémon has always had extra side stories that are almost never thought to be considered part of a Nuzlocke. Doing Super Contests aren't required to complete a Nuzlocke of Sinnoh games, and Pokestar Studios isn't required when doing a Nuzlocke of Pokémon Black 2 and White 2. Thank Arceus for that. 
It's not exactly the same thing here, of course, but I think it's safe to say that the Victory Road storyline can serve as the most basic skeleton of all Paldean Nuzlocks. Now, you can always choose to supplement the Victory Road storyline by also doing the Starfall Street and Path of Legends storylines, which have their own conclusions and final battles that match up well with the final fights of the Victory Road arc. And by choosing to intersperse these storylines between gym battles, you'll actually get perks that'll make your Nuzlocke and your playthrough in general much more enjoyable. For example, beating Titans unlocks new features for your sentient bike, making it much easier and much faster to move throughout Paldea. For my future playthroughs, whether I include absolutely every boss battle from all three storylines will likely depend on the specific challenge. But in general, just remember to do what you think will be most fun. So now let's move on to talking about hardcore Nuzlocke rules, probably the most common variation of the standard Nuzlocke rule set. As you might be able to glean from the self-serious name, this rule set is meant to make Nuzlocke's even harder than they already are. It consists of three additional rules. First, you cannot use items in battle. Held items are allowed, but this prevents spamming X items or healing items that can be used to make most battles completely trivial. This rule is largely the same in Pokemon Scarlet and Violet as it is in any other generation, though I did allow the use of Pokedolls in my playthrough to escape from random Pokemon that were incredibly overleveled. The second rule is that you cannot level up past the level of the next Gym Leader, Star Boss, or Titan Pokemon. This prevents you from just brute forcing battles with overleveled Pokemon, meaning that you'll have to come up with more creative solutions to potential problems. In Scarlet and Violet, this does mean that you'll need to complete the boss battles in a very specific order based on their level cap. In fact, because of permadeath, I'd highly recommend that you go through the game in level cap order for any Nuzlocke, even if you aren't playing with hard level caps. The level cap order is shown here, spoiler free. Whether you choose to use level caps for every single boss battle, or just the gym leaders, is entirely up to you and how you decide to approach the Nuzlocke. But if you do choose to use all the level caps, you'll need to be really careful and not overlevel between the various boss battles. The third and final rule of a hardcore Nuzlocke is that you must play on set mode, which means that you do not get a free switch after the enemy Pokemon faints. This makes battles significantly more difficult, since you often need to spend a turn bringing in another teammate that better handles the new enemy. Sadly, set mode was removed in Generation 9. Which is dumb, but there's no use crying over spilled milk. If you want to play with set mode, you'll just have to manually keep your Pokemon in battle. It's not an elegant solution, but it's also not a particularly cumbersome one either. There are plenty of other random rules that you can add to your playthrough on top of the Hardcore Nuzlocke rule set to make the playthrough even harder. Some people ban setup moves, weather, moves like Toxic, and so on. The internet is always inventing new ways to play, and no matter what type of Nuzlocke you end up playing, I genuinely think that Scarlet and Violet are great games to do it in. The tediousness of grinding has been dramatically reduced, and being able to choose from three different storylines means that a Nuzlocke can be as involved as you want it to be. Plus, with random trainers being completely optional, Large portions of this game feel like boss battle gauntlets, effectively cutting the excess fat and letting you really focus on just the meat of the games, which is the difficult boss battles. In a lot of ways, this is the ROM hackiest a mainline Pokemon game has ever felt, and you might find yourself struggling a bit more than in your average Nuzlocke. I'll do a more in-depth analysis in a future video, but for now, let's quickly list just a few tips and tricks that you should be aware of when Nuzlocking these games. In a standard Scarlet and Violet playthrough, there are approximately 30 distinct areas where you can get encounters. That may seem like a lot, but compared to other mainline games, 30 is actually pretty low. For comparison, Hoenn and Sinnoh both have over 50 potential routes for encounters. So more than most Nuzlocke's, every single encounter in Paldea counts. And especially early on, you may find yourself with limited options. If you're looking for an early advantage, I'd highly, highly recommend choosing Fue Coco as your starter. Fire-type starters, in general, tend to be good go-to choices in Nuzlocke's, because fire-types are much rarer than grass and water-types, which is especially true in Paldea. Fire-types are also incredible into a majority of the boss battles you'll be facing in this game. The bug and grass-type gym leaders that are first and second are pretty much single-handedly swept by Fue Coco, and this is where your encounters will be fewest and far between. Fue Coco also just destroys two of the Elite Four members. His final evolution, Skeledurge, also guarantees you a ghost type, one of the best types to have in a Nuzlocke thanks to their dual immunities. And with Skeledurge's signature move, Torch Song, an 80 base power move that gives the user a special attack boost, sweeps are incredibly easy to pull off in a lot of different situations. Skeledurge is also a great user of the held item Throat Spray, which is one of the many powerful items that you'll get early access to in these games. 
Be sure to check out all the shops in the various towns spread throughout Paldea for all types of awesome battle items. In Generation 9, items like the Air Balloon, Focus Sash, and Throat Spray are now reusable, meaning that they'll no longer be consumed after a single use, and can instead be used once in every single battle making them much more viable for use in the Nuzlocke. Reusable Focus Ashes alone are incredible for setup purposes, so be sure to use these items early and often. And as a final note, if you're struggling with crap encounters early in the game, just remember that to some extent, Pokemon Scarlet and Violet are open world games, which means you can always go to new areas and catch Pokemon well before you might find yourself there by natural progression. In later areas, wild Pokemon might be over the level that you can actually use them at, but Terra Raids scale based on the number of badges you have, so even when wild Pokemon are at a higher level, you'll still be able to get low-leveled Pokemon from Raid Dens to buff up your numbers. With that, you should have everything you need to get started with a Nuzlocke in Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. But before we go, I want to leave you the most important takeaway from this entire video. And that is that no one, myself included, should ever tell anyone that there is a right way to play a video game, especially one where you're using self-imposed rules. This video is just my thoughts and my opinions. The secret zeroth rule of nuzlocking is to make sure that you are having fun. So if anything I laid out here doesn't seem fun to you, but you still want to try a nuzlocke, please change the rules. Do what you feel is best and don't let anyone prevent you from enjoying the game the way you want to. Nuzlocking Pokemon games are some of the best gaming experiences I've ever had, and I love getting to engage with a game that I've played for over 20 years in a continually new and exciting way. I want Nuzlocking and the community around it to be as welcoming and as accessible as possible, so that people who never thought that they'd be able to do one can at least give it a go and have some fun. Hopefully this video gave even just one person the confidence to pick up these games and see what Nuzlocking is all about. And on that note, if there's something about Nuzlocking that you think would be helpful to cover in a video like this, let me know in the comment section down below. I'm working on an exciting project for the channel that will hopefully be a great resource for anything and everything you'd ever want to know about Nuzlocking, and I'd love to hear your suggestions on topics. In the meantime, if you could subscribe to the channel and like the video, that would be much appreciated. Or don't, I don't know. But stay tuned for more Nuzlocke videos, and until then, remember to always, always, always... Play around the critical hit.